Hello! Welcome to the behind the scenes of the Kern Center machine. There are a lot of things that I want to talk about in this video, so I've split the video up into different sections, and if you'd like to visit each of those different sections, I've put the timestamps down in the description. We're going to first start with what I mentioned in the main video, which is the explanations for the themed ideas, and then we're going to transition into the planning phase, then the building phase, and then the testing phase. Like I mentioned in the main video, the Kern Center is Hampshire's officially certified living building, which means that it had to fulfill the requirements of the seven petals of the living building challenge. The seven petals of the living building challenge are materials, beauty, water, place, energy, health and happiness, and equity. And the Kern Center machine is split up into seven different sections, one for each petal, and each section contains tricks that demonstrate how the Kern Center fulfills the requirements of each of these petals. These sections show up in the same order that they get revealed on the board at the beginning. So the first table is materials and beauty, the second table is water, the third table is place and energy, and the fourth table is health and happiness and equity. Let's start with the first section, the materials section. So the dump truck is actually the only themed idea in this section, but the idea for that was that the materials, the rocks and the wood, get dumped into the dump truck, and then the dump truck slides down, which represents the fact that all the materials for the building are locally sourced. The next section of this machine is the beauty section, and the only trick I have for this is the can tilt trick. On one side of the stick is Morse code, and then as the can rotates, it reveals the other side of the stick, which has the answer on it. There are actually a bunch of different puzzles that are hidden throughout the Kern Center. For example, there's a series of letters underneath the staircase that can be decoded. There's also a specific arrangement of piping with a secret message hidden in it. And there's even one where you have to stand and look through a piece of glass at a specific angle in order to solve the puzzle. The Morse code puzzle that I chose for this machine is one of the real puzzles from the Kern Center. It's actually hidden in the floorboards on the second floor. But what do the puzzles have to do with beauty? Well, the idea is that they try to encourage you to look around your environment and notice the things that you might not notice otherwise, like the piping. Okay, so we're going to move into the water section now. Both of the tricks that I made for this section have to do with the gray water filtration system that's in the building. So the idea here is that the dirty rainwater falls onto the roof and then gets filtered into clean water that goes into a cup for you to drink. For the place section, I actually made two themed ideas. The first one is the bike zip line, which represents the fact that the building is more pedestrian friendly than automobile friendly, which is why the building has more walkways than parking lots. The next themed trick that I made for the place section was the electric car. It's actually just a regular car with batteries and a cardboard lightning bolt taped to it. It's kind of hard to tell in the video, but there's actually the plug end of an extension cord jammed into the wheels, preventing it from rolling down the board. And then when the plug gets removed, the car is allowed to slide down the ramp. Now this is supposed to communicate the fact that the car is plugged in, and then when the plug gets removed, the car is charged and it's able to roll down. And this represents place because the living building challenge requirement is that the building must have an electric car charging station. For the energy section, I also made two themed ideas. The first one is the trick with the solar panels. The idea here is that one of the solar panels slides to the end of the table, which completes the circuit between the sun, represented by the lamp, and the hairdryer, which allows the electricity to flow through, which turns the hairdryer on. The solar panels, of course, represent the fact that the building is entirely solar energy powered. The next energy related trick in the machine is what I like to call the battery powered auto tilt. It's not powered by the electricity from the batteries, but powered by the wait from the batteries. Wait, 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 wait. This one doesn't actually specifically connect to one of the requirements of the living building challenge, but you know, batteries, energy, the next section is the health and happiness section, which I actually made three themed ideas for. The first one is the trick that's hidden behind the piece of glass that gets revealed when the curtain gets pulled across. This is intended to represent the fact that there are a lot of windows instead of walls in the Kern Center, and that by letting sunlight in, it makes people happier and healthier. The next health and happiness trick is actually the trick that gets revealed by the curtain, which is the trampoline trick. Now, this is another one that's not specifically connected to one of the requirements of the living building challenge, but a trampoline is a good way to get exercise, so health, and it's also fun, so happiness. The final health and happiness trick is the watering can that waters the plant, and this symbolizes the plants that are inside the building. And finally, the equity section, we also have two themed ideas. The first one is the globe ball, which also doesn't connect to a specific living building challenge requirement, but the globe just represents worldwide equality. And the final equity themed trick is the goal of the machine, putting the coins into the piggy bank. This represents the fact that for every dollar spent on the building, half of a cent is donated to charity. Like I said in the main video, this machine was a school project for one of my classes. 
It was called Collaborative Design Projects, and basically the idea was you designed and then executed any kind of research project relating to environmental science over the course of a semester. Now, of course, I immediately recognized the opportunity to make a giant chain reaction machine, but there were two problems. First of all, I had no idea my professor would actually allow me to do that in the first place, and two, I had to figure out some way to tie it into environmental science. The first problem turned out to not even be a problem at all. She was actually really on board with the idea from the very beginning, and the second problem wasn't all that hard either. As soon as I found out about the whole seven pedals thing, it immediately reminded me of six simple machines and the format that I used for that machine, but instead of doing six sections, one for each simple machine, I would do seven sections, one for each pedal of the Living Building Challenge. Speaking of which, there are actually a lot of similarities between this machine and six simple machines in one. They're very similar in style. I tried to tone down the level of complexity and the level of compactness for both of them. They're also very similar in scope. They're both four tables long, although this one does have a little bit more in it. And they're also similar in their purpose. They were both intended to be used as educational tools. Six Simple Machines in One was intended to be used to teach, obviously, about the Six Simple Machines and their practical applications, and this machine is intended to be used as an educational tool about the Kern Center and about the Living Building Challenge, and to demonstrate in a more concrete way what it actually looks like for a building to be officially certified. Long story short, once it was actually settled that I would be making a machine for this project, I submitted a grant proposal with a proposed $500 budget to one of the school's funds in the hopes that they would cover some of the costs of the project, and it ended up getting accepted, and I got the full $500 budget, which turned out to be super useful when it came time to buy some of the foreign objects in this machine, like the piggy bank and the solar panels and the dump truck, and surprisingly the table coverings, which ended up costing about $100. At this point, I wrote out an idea list of all the different tricks that I thought could be possibilities for each of the pedals. Things like materials were pretty easy, because that's more of a concrete sort of idea, whereas things like beauty and equity were a little bit more obscure, and ideas for those were a little bit harder to come by. Then, over spring break, I went out to a bunch of different stores to try to find the foreign objects that I knew I'd be needing for this machine, and I ended up being able to find a few of them, like the piggy bank, the watering can, the felt curtain, and the lamp. Other objects, like the dump truck, the fan for some reason, and the solar panels were a little bit harder to find, and I had to order them through Amazon. As for all of the wood that I used in this machine, a lot of it was just mine to begin with, but all the rest of it I got from my uncle who owns a woodworking shop near where I live, and he gave me a lot of his scrap wood that he had accumulated over previous projects, which not only was super helpful, but I also ended up getting really nice pieces of wood out of it, including those really nice dark brown boards that I used for the intro. After I got back from spring break, it was time to secure an official building location for this machine, and through the help of a ton of people who work in this building, I was able to secure this room which is actually owned by a professor who wasn't teaching a class this semester and is retiring after this year. So he was nice enough to let me borrow his basement room for his last semester. Here's the thing though. This room looked entirely different the first time I got in here. First of all, those two middle tables had to be moved apart slightly. I also had to take out all of the blue dividers. Then I had to add a fourth table into the room. And then I had to rearrange all of the filing cabinets and all the shelving units just so that I could put the four tables against the wall and then there was just a bunch of general cleanup to do. Once I had the room sufficiently rearranged, it was time to bring all those materials from my dorm room into this room, which is in the basement of the science building on campus. I ended up using a cart to carry everything, but it still took three trips to get everything here. But on the bright side, I only got weird looks from five people when I was basically just giving a wagon ride to a piggy bank and a dump truck. There's this really great steel table in the back of the room that I used to put a lot of my materials on top of, but I also used the filing cabinets and shelving units that were already in the room to put all my materials in more convenient locations. Side note, since I've been storing all of my materials in my dorm room since like October of last year when I was building Domino's vs. Machines, my dorm room just got super empty when I moved everything into this room, but it was fine because I was spending all my time here anyway. Alright, let's talk about the building process. One interesting thing that I did do in this machine that I had never done in the past and didn't even plan to do for this machine was build all the tricks out of machine order. What does that mean? Well, usually when I build a project, I start with the beginning and then add the next trick after that, then the next trick, then the next trick, etc. until all the tables are finished. And I've always made machines in this more linear fashion. For example, the bet losing machine. For the most part, the first tricks that you see in the machine were the first tricks that I made, and the tricks that happened at the end of the machine were, for the most part, the tricks that I built last. For this machine, I did start building on the first table, but then I went and worked on the third table, and then I got distracted and worked on the fourth table, came back to the third table, finished that one, went back to the fourth table, then I went to the second table and started on that one, 
then I finished the first table, no, then I finished the second table, then I finished the first table, then I had the whole thing done. I think. I don't remember. I'm only bringing this up because in the behind the scenes video for the bet losing machine, I went through all the tricks in the order that I built them in, but for this video I'm going to go through all the tricks in the order that they happen in the machine, just to be a little less confusing. And I'm also going to go through all of the tricks that are themed first, then the unthemed tricks. Okay, so let's just start with the first trick in the machine, the intro board. I had the idea of doing a section that revealed each of the seven pedals of the Living Building Challenge ever since the very beginning, since I wanted to do something similar to what I did for Six Simple Machines in One, where I had the Simple Machines get revealed by the mousetraps. Obviously, I didn't want to do it in the exact same way, so I had to come up with another way of revealing each of the seven pedals. And I didn't really have a good idea for how I wanted to do it until I thought of the billiard ball chain that pushes over the playing cards. The next trick in this machine is the dump truck trick, which actually... The next trick in this machine is the dump truck trick, which actually was the first trick that I built for this machine. I always knew that I wanted to have it roll down a ramp, but the first thing I noticed aside from that was that the bed of the truck actually falls down really slowly. And I really liked that idea, so I decided to take advantage of it by adding some weights underneath to make it fall a little bit faster and thus more reliably, and then having it push out the ball was just kind of a natural progression from that. And then having it actually fall down as it's rolling down the ramp was a really nice overlapping motion that I think turned out really great. That's not to say this trick was without its issues, though. The main challenge was actually stopping the truck. I mean, this thing weighs like 8 pounds, and then you add all the rocks and wood into the bed of it, and that thing is super heavy, especially when it slides down a ramp. Now, I couldn't just put a block there, because one, it would either just break everything, or two, it would cause too many vibrations and trigger everything on the table at the exact same time. So I had to come up with a clever solution to how to stop the truck. Originally, the idea was to use a tilted mousetrap to stop the truck, but even that turned out to not be enough force to stop the truck, and eventually the force was just too much, and it just completely came unglued anyway. So, it was at this moment that I invented one of my new, all-time favorite Kinex techniques, the shock absorber. The basic idea of the Kinex shock absorber is that you use the friction of a rod sliding through a connector as a way to slowly decelerate an object. I love this technique so much because you can change the length of the deceleration period by changing the length of the rod, or you can add more friction by adding more connectors or more rods. And of course you can always change the height and the direction and the orientation as well, which basically makes the options for this unlimited. The shock absorber that I used to catch the dump truck is pretty heavy duty, it's two rods sliding through two connectors, but what I really love about this technique is that in essence, it's two pieces. In fact, I used the two-piece version of this technique in other places in this machine, namely to stop the electric car, the watering can, and the little cart that carries the can. One more thing, this shock absorber is incredibly reliable. I had the dump truck collide with it, and it always slid through the shock absorber the exact same amount of distance. That's why the track that falls down to catch the yellow ball always falls in the exact same spot every single time. In fact, that part never even failed. Okay, so we're moving into the next theme trick, which is the rotating and falling can, which is part of the beauty section. The original idea for this was just to have the wooden plank with the code written on it get revealed in some way, but I didn't really have a good way of doing it. And to be honest, I don't really remember how I thought of this idea, but I really like it. It's a lovely new take on an old classic machine trick. The next theme tricks in this machine are the two back-to-back -back water tricks. Now, originally the water inside each of the bottles was supposed to be released in a much different way than what you see in the final video. Originally, I had a little plastic sheet that I would put over the water bottle itself, which would hold the water in by pressure, and then it would just get removed. I replaced that mechanism on the first bottle first, because the starting position for that bottle is actually not above the roof at all, and if the lid falls off, the water will just fall out directly onto the table. And I decided that was way too risky, so I changed the mechanism to something where the water is contained within the bottle until the bottle tips and allows the water to flow out. The little plastic sheet covering the lid on the second bottle actually lasted a lot longer than it did on the first bottle, but eventually I had to replace it because it caused problems in the reset process. It actually worked fine in the machine, but when I was resetting it wouldn't stay set up for anything more than like five minutes, which was just really annoying. So I decided to change it to an equally simple cap unscrewing mechanism. One of the biggest challenges of working with water is that water and glue do not mix, especially with wood. So if you look closely in this section, you'll notice that I actually covered a lot of the wood surfaces with tape, which helped give a little bit of an insulation to the wood to prevent it from getting super wet and thus having the glue come off. One other thing that I had to keep in mind when working with water was the issue of resetability. In other words, how do I get the water from where it ends up back to where it starts? And particularly for the second trick, 
this was a bit of an issue, but I ended up designing the trick in such a way that you could take apart the bottle tipping mechanism and remove the lever that the water falls into entirely so that you can pour the water back into the bottle. And even though I tried my hardest throughout the building and the testing process, as you can imagine, mistakes still happened and water ended up spilling everywhere on a very consistent basis, which is why underneath the table there is a stockpile of paper towels and refills for the water so that I can have the same amount in each bottle every time. The next theme trick is the bike zipline, which is actually one of the quickest tricks that I made for this entire machine. When I knew that I was going to be making a bike out of Kinex, I knew that I was going to have to do several revisions in order to get it to look right. So I made the first model, and it looked perfect, so that's what I used. <laughs> one other really fun thing that I added to this model was a little water bottle holder underneath, just for that little bit of extra accuracy. One of the challenges I encountered with this trick was keeping the string tight enough so that the zipline would actually work. And each of the bases of the zipline have to be glued down really well to the table. The next theme trick is the electric car. And really the only thing I want to say about this one is that I thought originally that the visual of having the extension cord be plugged into the car would be enough to communicate the electric car concept. But when I watched it, it didn't really convey the message clearly, so I decided to just tape some batteries onto the top and then make a little cardboard lightning bolt and put that on the hood. And I think it turned out really well. The hairdryer and solar panel sequence is the next themed trick, and this was actually the first section that was done. I said that I built the dump truck trick first, which is true, but the solar panel and hairdryer sequence was the first to actually have a beginning and an end with real connections and stuff. Originally the plan was to use a power strip to turn on the hairdryer, but then I realized that the switch on the hairdryer itself was a lot easier to trigger, so I just decided to go with that. The real difficult part about this trick, though, was getting the timing right between the first solar panel and the ball, because it's actually sliding as the ball is bouncing on top of it. As for the battery-powered auto tilt, I guess you could say this trick was free-built? I mean, it definitely wasn't planned from the beginning. All I had to start with for this trick was the fan itself, and originally the idea was to have the board get blown over by the fan, but that turned out to be really unreliable and really messy, so I decided to just do an auto tilt board and then have those clear sheets of plexiglass get blown over by the fan. But then I realized that I put the fulcrum of the board way too far to one side and it took a lot of weight to actually tilt the board. And then I was experimenting with how much weight exactly, and I'm like, oh, four batteries worth of weight. Batteries. Energy. I'm just going to use the batteries. Really the only challenge after that point was figuring out a new and fun creative way of getting all four batteries to one end of the board. And I'm very happy with the trick that I came up with in order to do that. It reminds me a lot of something that Pitakura Suichi would do. Alright, moving into the final table now, the first theme trick over there is the curtain reveal trick. Originally the idea for this was to have the curtain fall forward, and I even had a mechanism built for it and everything, but it just didn't look the way I wanted to, I wasn't really happy with it, so I decided to revisit it, and I'm really happy with the way that I made it this time around, by actually using the curtain as an actual curtain with a curtain rod and everything, it just looks a lot nicer this way. That being said though, the structure that I had to make for this trick was actually really tough to make and it made me wish I had more woodworking experience so that I could actually make a nice looking box with clear sides and a nice hanging curtain rod without just gluing everything. One neat little design element here that I think is really cool are the two magnets that are attached to the string that pull the curtain across. This isn't a new design element by any means, it's been done by myself and by others in past machines, but that's the thing about motors, is unless you design in a way for the motor to get turned off, the motor's just going to keep on pulling, which is either going to break your machine or jam the motor, unless you design in a place where the string can break, which is where the magnets come in. The magnets are strong enough to keep the string intact while the curtain is sliding across, but once the curtain can't go any further, the magnets disconnect, allowing the motor to continue rotating without jamming it or destroying the machine. Which brings me to the one thing that I wish were a little bit different about this trick, and that is the speed at which the curtain goes across. I did try to change this by increasing the diameter of the circle that the string wraps around, but if you think about it, really all that does is move the string further away from the point of rotation on the motor, which means that it requires more force for the motor to turn. And like we talked about with the magnets, all that really resulted from that was the magnets disconnecting too early and the curtain being left halfway across, or the motor just jammed anyway. So I had no choice but to wrap the string around a rod and just deal with the slow speed. As for the stuff that's actually behind the curtain, it's not even possible in the main video to see how the launcher gets triggered, but there is a really cool mechanism there. I'm just not going to show it to you. Of course I'm going to show it to you, come on. Really? Really? 
I actually had the idea of doing a straight up launch with a track that swings in to catch the ball on its way down for a really long time, but I just didn't have the idea fully developed in my mind yet to put it into an actual machine. But this machine was the perfect opportunity for it, because I'm not actually looking for super complex tricks, just new and interesting ideas. In fact, I think that concept has only been done one other time in the past, and it was a little bit different looking. It was this clip from Eleven Inventions 7. One more thing about this section, and then I'm going to move on. One thing you probably didn't really think about was the fact that since this section is up against the wall, how do I reset it? Well, there's actually a door back there, and in order to reset the machine, I had to crawl underneath the table, open the door, and stand in the doorway to reset the machine. That's why there's this little string attached to the doorknob. The next themed trick is the watering can trick, and this was actually the first water-related trick that I made for this machine, so even before the water section itself. And obviously that means that I dealt with the same glue and water and wood issues that I did with the water section. The issue of resetability that I talked about with the water section wasn't as much of an issue for this trick because I wasn't using the same water every time. I would just get new water and put it back into the watering can. But the water that comes out of the bottom of the clay pot actually got dumped into this really gross bin of water that I had at the bottom of the table. And I also kept a water bottle and cup next to the table as well that I could use to refill the watering can. You might be surprised to know that the globe auto-tilt trick is actually one of my favorites in the entire machine. And you might be even more surprised when I say that I honestly think it's an example of the perfect machine trick for a machine like this. I mean, think about it. It's got complexity, but it's not super intricate. It's got a really nice aesthetic. It looks really good with those nice wooden rails. It was also super reliable. And it was creative and original. I mean, we've all seen triple auto tilts before, but doing it with a little gate that falls down on one end and a little kicker that kicks it up the other end, that's a combination that I've never seen before. Add that all together with the fact that it's a themed idea, and you'll see why I think it's the example of a perfect machine trick. And finally, the final themed idea in the Kern Center machine is the piggy bank at the end. And really the only thing I want to say about this one is that this was intended to be the goal all the way from the very beginning. I knew that I wanted to make the donation the final step in the machine, and I think it was a really nice choice. I think it really wraps up the entire machine in a really nice way. Okay, so now that we've talked about all the themed ideas, I'm going to start all the way back at the beginning of the machine and go through all of the unthemed ideas. Now, I'm not going to talk about all of them, because some of them I just don't have that much to say about. So we're going to start all the way back at the beginning of the machine with the sequence right after the dump truck. What I especially love about this sequence is that it splits off into two separate paths that, at least in the main video, synchronize perfectly at the end. The first path being the billiard ball that pushes the track down for the yellow ball to roll down and then into a cup. The cup tilts over into a second cup. And then the second path being the golf ball that goes down the zigzag board and triggers the marble launcher. The marble releases the weight for that second cup that the yellow ball is in and lifts it up. Now, I know that the timing on the video looked and, and yeah, okay, note to editor, leave it at lifts it up. That was ridiculous and I'm not going to do that again. So yeah, it looks like a timing trick, and to be honest it was intended to be, but it just wasn't designed to cut it that close. Although, I'm sure you'll agree with me on this, I would take what happened in the main video, where the timing is really impressive, over a delay of like 5 seconds, any day of the week. Alright, skipping ahead through the machine a little bit, I want to talk about the gear powered ball lift and tipping structure trick. When I was first thinking about this idea, I originally intended for it to be the trick that gets revealed behind the curtain in the health and happiness section, but then as I developed it a little bit more in my mind, I realized that one, it was going to be way too big, and two, it was going to require table connections that I didn't have access to if I was confined within that small space. So I decided to move it over to the second table with the water section because I knew that I was going to have a lot more extra room for unthemed ideas since I had devoted that entire table to only one pedal as opposed to two. One of the tricks that I think kind of gets lost in the shuffle within the scope of the machine is actually the clothespin launch. I'm really happy with the magnet mechanism that triggers it, and I'm also really proud of the accuracy of the launch itself. This was an idea that I had back in December of last year, and I even built it. It was for my first attempt at a clip for the 11 Builders Challenge Part 2 that I never finished, and before I took it apart I posted video of part of the clip on Twitter so it wouldn't be a complete waste. And I say part of it, because the other part of the clip was this trick, and I wanted to save it for later. One other funny thing I want to mention is that the second curve for the glass marble is actually made out of hot glue sticks. So yes, I hot glued hot glue sticks. The last unthemed trick that I want to talk about is the funnel trick on the fourth table. Interestingly enough, it's not actually a funnel. It's a light dome. 
It just happens to be the perfect shape and size, and the opening at the bottom is the perfect size for a Trix trackball. I just really love how I use this object in such a perfect way that you don't even realize that it's a foreign object. So that's basically all the tricks in this entire machine. And I'm extremely happy with how every single one of them turned out, but I don't really have a favorite trick, although I could give you an unordered top three. I would say the top three for me are the dump truck sequence, the solar panel and hairdryer sequence, and the globe auto tilt trick. Now I just wanted to talk about some things about the machine as a whole. One thing you may notice in this machine, but it's really, really subtle, is that I actually attempted a color code for each of the four tables. The first table was supposed to be yellow, the second table was supposed to be green, the third table was blue, and the fourth table was red. Basically all this means is that I would try to choose an object that fit with the color scheme whenever possible, but really this was only possible when I had multiple color options of that object. So things like bulk dominoes, domino rally dominoes, popsicle sticks, billiard balls, ping pong balls, etc. I'll talk about this a little bit more later, but I actually ended up running out of a lot of materials towards the end of the building process, so I ended up violating this rule plenty of times, but I still think if you look closely you can see the intent. One thing I'm really proud of with this machine is that I actually ended up using a lot of foreign objects in this machine, aside from the obvious themed ones. And a lot of these were objects that I've had for a long time, but only used once or twice, or maybe even never. This machine was the first time I got to use these metal cups, this can, the slinky, and the trampoline. And it was the second time I got to use the marble launcher and the clothespin after they made their debut in the bet losing machine. One foreign object, if you could even call it that, that I wished I had incorporated into this machine was the Connects chain. I tried building something that was going to lift the yellow ball onto the top of the first metal cup, but I couldn't get the mechanism to work smoothly or consistently, so I ended up replacing it with the second metal cup that lifts up. And I actually like that version even more. There were also a lot of objects that were already in this room that I ended up improvising into the machine, including the funnel light dome, the two glass sheets that catch the blue ping pong ball, these metal pieces that I used as weights for the auto tilt board and the water bottles, all of the batteries, and the bricks that I used as supports for the water trick and the dump truck trick, and even the hair dryer was found in this room. Like I mentioned earlier, as I was nearing the end of this machine, I was running low or completely out on a lot of my materials, including the metal weights, popsicle sticks, domino rally dominoes, billiard balls, tricks track, and several connects pieces, including yellow rods and yellow connectors. As you can imagine, this placed plenty of constraints on what I could do to finish off the machine, and especially with connects, this meant that I actually revisited some of the previous contraptions that I had made and started stealing the parts from them. One thing I noticed as I was running out of a lot of my other materials was that I wasn't running low on Hot Wheels track, and I realized this was actually because I wasn't using all that many. This machine, in its entirety, only contains 28 Hot Wheels tracks, which is an incredibly low number considering what I've made in the past. And by the way, I'm including any length of Hot Wheels track here, even the really tiny short one, like after the intro board, and I'm counting the tracks separately if they're part of multiple in a row, like the one in the place section, or the one connecting tables 1 and 2. This abnormally low Hot Wheels track count can probably partially be attributed to the fact that I used a lot of clear tubes in this machine as Hot Wheels track alternatives, but it also has to do with the fact that there were a lot of themed tricks in this machine, which don't use quite as many Hot Wheels tracks, but also, potentially, it's showing that my style is diverging a little bit more away from endless track tricks, which is a development that I'm pretty excited about. In the end, this machine was the largest machine that I've ever made, both by surface area and probably by part count as well. And technically it's also the longest machine I've made by time. It takes 2 minutes and 45 seconds to fully react, which ever so slightly edges out the bet losing machine, which takes 2 minutes and 42 seconds. Although it's kind of up to you whether you really want to count that, because there is an almost 30 second segment of this machine of just the curtain getting pulled across. I tend to hold the position that in spirit, the bet losing machine is longer, although it technically takes 3 seconds longer for this machine to go off. Okay, so let's switch gears a little bit and talk about the testing process and a little bit about the fails. As you may remember from the main video, this machine had 103 fails, which was actually right around the number that I was aiming for. I wanted to get it in under 100, but I'll take 103, that's fine. One particularly frustrating thing about the testing process for this machine was that I had a lot of reset fails, way more than I usually do, which is weird because I always develop a really well-oiled reset routine so I don't forget anything. Now I haven't actually counted the number of reset fails that I had for this machine, but future editing version of me has, and he's put the number right over there. Now I don't even have a really good explanation as to why this could have been the case. 
I wouldn't attribute it to the length of the machine because I didn't have this problem with the bet losing machine. I wouldn't say it's because this machine is especially big because I didn't have this problem with six simple machines. And I definitely wouldn't say it's because it's complicated because I didn't have this problem with trickshot machine. In the behind the scenes video for the bet losing machine, I did a fail reaction compilation and you guys really seem to enjoy that. So I'm gonna do it again for this video. Oh, it's going. It's gonna get there. Yeah, you can do it. Oh, I'm done. I'm done. Oh my god. Oh, what is happening? Are you kidding me right now? Just brilliant. Just amazing. Um, I'm really, 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 really happy. I'm really happy right now. I'm, I'm like so thrilled. Hmm. Beyond ecstatic, actually. That's that's what I'm feeling. No way. No way. How did it? How? Whoa. Okay. Huh. What? Where did it even go? It is trapped under under here somehow. Ooh, getting closer. Oh. <gasps> Oh, 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 Did I not do that? What did I do? Oh. What the heck? Not even the blue one, huh? Not even the blue one works. Huh. Amazing. What? Come on. Move faster, little boy. I knew that was going to happen at some point. I knew it. Just when I say, I don't think I need more water in there. I think I have too much water in there. Look how right I was. Like, it didn't even make it to here. Uh, okay. Oh. Uh. There we go. I'd say that was a pretty good test. The section of this machine that failed the most was, as expected, on the first table. It was the section right after the dump truck trick, where the paths split off and do two different things that synchronize at the end. Sometimes what happens is the marble wouldn't launch all the way up the wooden board, and other times the timing between both of those elements was off, causing the cup to tilt at the wrong time, and then have the second cup come up before the ball was actually in it. The most failed trick is hardly ever the most frustrating trick, however, and this machine was no exception. The most frustrating trick in this machine was the battery-powered auto-tilt. Some of the fails that happened the most often with the battery-powered auto-tilt was that the batteries wouldn't hit each other properly as they hit each other one by one on the way down the first time. Sometimes the ball that's in the cup would fall out of the cup early as the plexiglass pieces were falling like dominoes, and sometimes the batteries wouldn't stay in a straight line as they all slide to one end of the board and there were also plenty of other times that this trick failed for random reasons. It actually got to the point where near the end of the testing phase, I was actually thinking, once we pass the battery-powered auto-tilt, we are in the clear, the machine's gonna work. And that actually ended up being true. The fourth table only failed one time, and it was because of a reset fail. The riskiest trick in this machine was definitely the trick right after the battery-powered auto-tilt, the launch into the funnel between tables three and four. Now it was risky, but I wouldn't say it was unreliable. And that's especially due to the fact that these launchers are amazingly accurate. So even though this part worked on a pretty consistent basis, I was still taking a big risk here. The challenge with this launch trick wasn't actually the accuracy of the launch itself. In fact, aside from a couple of very rare fringe instances, the ball went into the funnel every single time. Sometimes though, it would curve around the bowl and jump out instead of staying inside. Just like there were a lot of tricks that had a lot of problems and failed a lot of times, there were also tricks that surprised me and failed surprisingly few times, if at all. Some of these tricks and elements include the 720 degree marble funnel spin, the gear powered ball lift and falling structure, the clothespin launch, the extension cord track, the solar panel pong shot, the hair dryer launch, and like I mentioned, the launch between tables three and four. This machine kind of came out of nowhere a little bit for me. Like I said at the beginning of the video, I had no idea I would even be able to make a machine for this class, let alone one this big. And if you told me only a few months ago that I'd be making the largest machine that I've ever made during only my second semester of college, you know what, actually, you know what, I would have believed you. 
It actually sounds like something I would totally do. <laughs> anyway, the point is, it's not like this machine was some kind of project that I've wanted to work on for a really long time and just never got around to it or anything like that. In fact, the plan for this semester was just to work on personal projects, like finishing the first episode of my new ScreenLink series, for one thing. I mean, I've been working on building this machine only since after spring break, and Bet Losing Machine took me four months to make. So I guess all I'm saying is, I was lucky enough to have this incredible opportunity, and I just ran with it. I'd like to wrap up this video by just saying that this machine is the perfect example of why I chose Hampshire College. During my time here, I want to continue my passion for chain reactions by tying them into school assignments whenever I possibly can, and when I'm not doing that, use my free time to work on more independent chain reaction projects. By continuing to make chain reaction projects by tying them into school assignments, I can work on developing my craft while simultaneously being a full-time student, and eventually I hope to have a sizable portfolio of machine projects of all kinds that I can use to help make my passion into a career. That's the goal, at least. So uh, I think that's it. That's all I have for you guys for the behind the scenes of the Kern Center machine. I hope you enjoyed this little bit of a peek behind the curtain, if you will. This video is actually the second behind the scenes video that I've made for a machine. The first one being the behind the scenes of the bet losing machine, which I referenced several times in this video. But I'm totally open to making more of these for future videos. So let me know down in the comments below if you like these and if you'd like to see more. And if so, what you'd like me to change or add or get rid of. If you'd like to watch the actual machine and go back to the main video, you can click right up here. If you'd like to watch the behind the scenes video for the bet losing machine that I've been talking about through this entire video, you can click down there. And if you'd like to subscribe to my channel, you can click right here. I'm Jack of All Spades 98, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye guys.